I think it should work. And I'm now going to make you the, the spotlight for everyone. So whenever you're, you're going to talk, I'm going to make you a spotlight. And yeah, I think um, we are about to go live. Uh, I just need a confirmation that we are live on YouTube right now. Yes, we are. So the floor is yours. Uh, we're very honored to have you, Pedro, today as the moderator. And yeah, I'm, I think we all wait, are waiting a very exciting panel discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the panel Emerging Words of African Imaginaries. My name is Pedro Afonso. I am a Berlin-based percussionist, United Nations consultant and researcher working across the cultural, creative, and development sectors. Today, I will have the pleasure to moderate our panel. On this panel, we will discuss the importance of traditions in African cultures, the relationship between and the role of traditions and innovation in shaping and reshaping the way the world perceives Africa's past, present, and future. Proposing an uh, interdisciplinary discussion, we will address topics and areas such as language, literature, narrative, Afrofuturism, decolonization, and post-colonialism. Through connecting these topics, we intend to highlight the contributions that Africa, Africans, and the Afro-diaspora are making for themselves and the world. During the afternoon, we will have three panelists. First of them, Dr. Roland Nidil. He is a doctor of literature and philosophy from the University of South, South Africa with uh, research interests related to decoloniality, history, policy of education. His current research focused on the transformation in the history curriculum in Cameroon and South Africa, within which he has published a significant number of peer review papers and book chapters. The second panelist is Dr. Vimbai Matiza Motonbeni. She is a doctor of philosophy in African language and literature with the University of South Africa. Dr. Vimbai is also a senior lecturer in the Department of African Language and Cultures at Midlands State University in Zimbabwe. Her research interest is in African cultures and the contribution to development of mankind. She has also researched and published in areas, for instance, language and development, drama, theater for development, oral literature, discourse analysis, among other cultural and African issues. The third panelist is Dr. Oduo Obura. He holds a PhD from the University of Potsdam in Germany. His research interests include the cultures and literatures of Eastern Africa and Anglophone modernities. He has extensively researched on decolonial topics in childhood cultures and politics in Eastern Africa. Some of his publications include Decolonizing Childhoods in Eastern Africa, as well as Representations and Emerging Trends in Eastern African Literatures and Cultures. Dr. Oduo Obura is currently a lecturer at ZTEC University in Nairobi, Kenya. We will have, during this afternoon, rounds of questions to our panelists, and also the possibility to get questions from the public, from you who is watching us from around the world. So in the meantime, our panelists are answering the questions. Please start in taking notes, start thinking about questions you would like to answer. We will also have the possibility for our panelists to ask questions to each other and to build on, on what each other has said. So we have the whole ground for a very productive conversation. And we count naturally with you all to enrich this conversation. The first questions will be addressed to Dr. Roland. Dr. Holland, 
Good afternoon. I hope you can hear and see us clear and sound. Yes, Pedro, I can see you good and I can hear you. Good to see and have you here with us. Thank you very much for your presence. The first two My questions pleasure. I would I would like to ask are the first one, is it possible to talk about African culture in the singular or shall we talk about multiple African cultures? The second question is, can traditions play a negative role in the socioeconomic and educational development of African communities? The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Pedro. I, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the opportunity given to me to, I would, since we don't have much time, I would go straight to answering the questions. Um, when we look at African culture, in the singular, it's, it's, it's quite difficult for us to talk about African culture in singular, especially if we have moved around the continent. Uh, you see different people, people have migrated from different areas and they have practiced uh, traditions differently. Uh, we may want to look at African culture in terms of maybe uh, referring to the continent as a whole, but within that continent, there are diverse ethnic groups and people who practice different and different, different, different traditions. So it is very difficult for us to begin to talk about an African culture in singular. Uh, we may also understand, we may also want to know that um, there, are, there are different practices that cut across the, the people of Africa, which you may even, I, I come from Cameroon and I see some of, for instance, the names in some of the ethnic groups in South Africa reflect some of the names that we have in Cameroon. But it is true that even marriage practices uh, may sound the same in different places. But in terms of wanting to say that we are looking at African culture in singular, we may be a little bit mistaken. So it's important for us to look at African cultures because if you see what is happening among the Yorubas in Nigeria, I want what is happening among the Maasai in Kenya, you'll find that it is quite a different. And that is what makes the richness of the continent, Africa. The variety of cultures. Even here in Cameroon, we have about 200 dressing in terms of the food they eat, which make both the tangible and intangible. Um, Looks like my connection is not. Yeah, I was saying that in, even here in Cameroon, we have about 260 ethnic groups, which make it um, uh, if, uh, make it difficult for us to begin to talk about uh, the same culture even within Cameroon. You have the belief systems are different, the dressing is different, the 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 food the food the food is different, the their way of life is different, their marriage practices are different, which. Um, so in that sense, with this all make up the tangible and intangible cultures of the people, which are different when we move from one ethnic group to another, including the languages. Now I go to the second question without wasting much of our time. Um, the first question's conclusion is that we cannot talk about African culture in singular. Um, there may be practices which uh, sound the same in different cultures, but that does not make it a singular culture. Um, the second question is quite interesting, which says, can traditions play a negative role in the socioeconomic and educational development of African countries? Uh, Pedro, since you've asked about the negative role, I will tell you that tradition can actually play a negative role in, 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 um, in the socioeconomic and educational development of Africa, uh, of, of, of African communities. For instance, um, remember, in terms of uh, uh, tra there are traditions which, which uh, tradition in itself, uh, within if I want to go back to what 
time uh, road is oriented uh, like Bagbo, it is practiced in our tradition. So there are traditions which inhibit certain things like um, uh, female education. A woman in, in our tradition, a woman is not supposed to go to school because uh, the tradition says a woman is not supposed to go to school. In that sense, uh, you see how a person that is uh, somebody who is who, who was supposed to be like uh, a, a, a role model to that community who is barred from acquiring education because tradition says a woman is not supposed to go to school. So in that sense, tradition plays a negative role. Uh, look at, um, take uh, for instance, uh, traditions which promote uh, things like female genital mutilation, which we are fighting against today. So um, uh, these are things which, uh, which affect people's health, affect people's uh, uh, development, affect people's intellectual capacities, and improvement affect people's interactions with other other people. Uh, some traditions say you must not get married to this girl because the girl was betrothed to the gods and the girl is an osu and all that. So you see some of these, some uh, traditional practices um, can actually affect uh, people's socioeconomic and educational development. Uh, if you want to go back to even before, the missionary, I'm um, an educational historian, that's why I like to go back to this. If you look at the statistics of enrollment in schools in the colonial days, um, they, there were more of boys in the schools than girls because tradition said that the women cannot go to school, you see? So imagine by the time when, when uh, people got independence in the 60s, there were few women in admission. And today, even today, there are few women in um, uh, these traditional practices, I'm able to name all, but I think that uh, some of the traditional practices actually uh, negatively affect the socioeconomic and educational development of African communities. But I guess quite a good number of people are moving away from those traditions. I will not end this, and this answer without saying that. Um, some of these practices are being discouraged and people have understood the reasons why they are being discouraged and they are moving away from them, such as uh, maybe the cultures like female genital mutilation, uh, the, 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 the right of a girl, uh, the right to education for every child. I think most communities are beginning to understand some of this, uh, the, the need for people to move away from such traditions and uh, embrace uh, the development of their communities. And uh, quite a good number of women have shown these examples and have given them the, the, the people the justifications that there is need for us to avoid certain traditional practices. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to the second uh, batch of discussions. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much, Dr. Roland. Pleasure to, to have you here. I'm now transferring the floor to Dr. Vimbai. Dr. Vimbai, good afternoon. Can you, can you see and hear me perfectly? Yes, I can hear you, Pedro. Nice to have, he, nice to have you here. We can see and you and hear you. All right. So my two Thank questions you. for you are, could you talk about the importance of oral traditions in different African cultures? This is the first question. The second one is, can traditions be a source of innovation to cultural products and services being produced around Africa, not only Sub-Saharan Africa, but Northern Africa as well? And when, in your case, do you see these traditions being injected into innovations? For instance, we know we work with music, film, literature, and so on. So if you could bring uh, interesting examples for us, would be great. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone um, who is here. I want to start by uh, my first question, uh, which talks about oral tradition. I would like to first define what oral tradition is before I move on to the importance of that tradition. 
Uh, in uh, my understanding of oral tradition is those are utterances that are spoken or recited based on a performer who, um, who that performer performs them for a purpose. So in that regard, we are saying oral tradition are those utterances that are passed on from one generation to the next generation by word of mouth. And when they are passed on by word of mouth, they are received by uh, the body, the, the, the ears, and are responded by the body. So when we say uh, these oral traditions are responded to by the body, we are saying whatever the person in that culture is doing, they are responding to that oral tradition that they would have received by word of mouth. So in that regard, we are looking at uh, their proverbs, their belief systems, their religions, etc. So the important, the importance of those values, the impartation of values, ideals, customs, beliefs to generations from a storehouse of a people's culture. So we know a people's culture is embedded with all these ideals, these values, these traditions. So by way of imparting these, that's quite important to any, any culture in Africa. Then the second um, a importance that I will talk about is it gives Africans the sense of agency uh, to act upon their situations. Uh, like, for example, we have a proverb uh, that says um, one good thing deserves another. We have that in our in our in my Shona language where I come from. So we are saying if that uh, ideal is imparted to other generations, then it means. Uh, these ideals and values are a gives the African people a sense of agency to act upon themselves. They know that in Africa there is no individualism. You have to be part of the community so as to our generations when these are imparted to our various the, the, the aspect of agency. Then my second question uh, is on uh, can tradition be a source of innovation to cultural products and services being produced around Africa? And my first answer to that question is yes, definitely it is uh, uh, there a source of innovation because um, the second part asks about when do you see this? And uh, I think when we use the word when, it sounds like they, they are not yet uh, used in innovation. And in my own view, they are already part of the innovation in Africa, in my community. And I, I think in, in the whole of Africa, these oral traditions are already part of the innovations that we see when people produce their music, when people produce their films, when people produce their, their literature, their drama. These oral traditions are already part and parcel of that form of literature. Uh, for example, we uh, we talk of uh, the creative writing, the literature that we have. Uh, I think we all agree with me that in literature we have uh, uh, the, the development of literature where we see uh, some books of uh, artworks that were those uh, types of literatures are a more like the forerunner of uh, what used to happen back then, which are a source of oral tradition. Professor we have Mbai. different uh, music that is produced in Africa where we see our youngsters now incorporate. Hello? Hello? Could Can you I continue? Yeah, could you just go back perhaps 20 Are seconds hearing... before from, from what you have said? Is there any problem? It yes. froze a bit, the connection. And I think what you were saying was very relevant, just for us to follow. 20 seconds before. If... Which part do you want me to elaborate on, Pedro? After you have said you see these traditions on a daily basis in your community in different parts of, of, of Africa, the oral okay, okay, of maybe. innovation. After this part. Okay. Okay, let me come again. 
uh, is the second part of the question which says, can traditions be a source of innovation to cultural, I'm sorry, when do you see this? When do you see this? And I'm saying probably the use of the question when might be a bit challenging to me because already these oral traditions are part of the innovations in Africa through music, through literature, through film. We are already seeing the injection of these oral traditions in these forms of performances. Like in music, we see the young generations are already using some of these uh, uh, oral art forms that were used back then in their songs. They are already um, incorporating some of the stories that were uh, told back then as form of oral tradition. The films that are produced, for example, in my community, we have uh, films uh, like uh, the likes of those that are uh, portrays life that was lived in pre-colonial times when people were still putting on uh, their, um, we call them mabechu, those the, those are uh, the dresses that were just put on the way it is. So I'm, I'm answering the question that these are uh, oral traditions are already part of the innovation that we see in today's films, literature, uh, drama, etc. I think that's uh, what I can say for now. I'm looking forward to the second session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vimbai. Thank you for, for your answers. Uh, the third speaker, it's Dr. Oduo. Good afternoon, Dr. Oduo. I hope you can hear and see us. All right, you are in Nairobi, in Kenya. Yes, I can hear you loud and clearly. Thank you very much for this chance. Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. Really glad to have you here. So the first question, it's more, I believe, a uh, definition question from your lenses, from your perspective, which is what is post-colonialism for you? You are somebody who are working around this topic. So we would like to know what is your perspective? And the second question is, how do you think education in the Western world interferes in the way Africa and therefore Africa cultures, traditions and innovations are perceived. And here you can use your whole experience of somebody who has also studied uh, here in Potsdam in, in Germany. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pedro. And I hope you can hear me as well uh, clearly. Um, I, I'll go straight away to the first question about the definition of post-colonialism. I think five minutes will not do a lot of justice to this uh, rather wide um, kind of epistemological question that you posed to me. So I think the beauty of post-colonialism in my view is that at some point it offered people uh, I think practitioners and those who subscribe to the ideas of post-colonialism, a space to offer certain kind of questions, right? A, a space to engage power between the colonized, between the uh, between the colonized and the colonizer. So I think that was one of the things that post-colonialism did, which I think we need to appreciate it much more than I believe it's already done. Now, um, you asked me about my opinion on this. <laughs> There's a sense in which I would want to think of post-colonialism in the past perfect tense, right? We can talk about post-colonialism in the present, what it has done, but I do think that we can also um, look at it in the terms, in the, sorry, we can look at post-colonialism in the ways in which it benefited that kind of binary kind of thinking, portraying the colonized versus the colonizer between the colonizing cultures and the, col the colonized cultures, between naming methods, between uh, the so-called European modernity against the savage of 
native and undeveloped um, other kind of cultures. So I think this is one way in which post-colonialism for me is no longer tenable within the present, right? Because we cannot operate within these kind of um, dichotomous distinction. But I think that I would be interested in ways in which all these conversations drive towards um, a cosmopolitan future, right? So that we move away from these artificial um, hierarchies that post-colonialism tends to fix us on, even as it tries to move from the very pins that it that fix us, you know. It uses these terms of um, power that enables us to stand fix, fixated on that kind of responding. I think post-colonialism was a matter of the of writing back to the empire. But I think what we do, for example, for me, coming from the global south from Africa, we are not only speaking back to the empire, we are also speaking to our own inadequacies in Africa. We are speaking to our own experiences and, ex and excesses in, in Africa. So I think I'm trying to move towards that kind of decolonial cosmopolitanism, so to speak, and we move away from post-colonialism in its um, usual currency. Uh -huh. And I think, again, trying to define postcolonialism for me would be trying to ask questions about the economics in all these arrangements. And I, in a way, I have, a, I have some sort of a conviction that postcolonialism has not done equally to open up spaces of talking about the economics of exploitation that has happened within the last um, 500 years between the Western world and the, and the non-Western world, right? Yeah, so I think in a way, um, I would say post-colonialism was uh, ceremonially adequate in the sense that at a certain point it was adequate, but Right now, I, I don't think that post-colonialism in its wider currency is um, kind of applicable for, for me, right? Now, let me move to the second question on education in the West and how it affects traditions and innovations. I think we'd have to look at this from um, some sort of a chronological approach. How has education been conducted in Africa? We are moving from the informal senses of um, education to the formal, which is introduced with the arrival of the Western modernity. And somehow it tries to supplant the traditional forms of education, which I think worked for the for Africans in those days, right? If it's a matter of skills and changing attitudes, that worked for them. But having this kind of new dispensation that we are talking of right now, having encountered um, uh, the Western modernity and cultures by their nature are not static, they are dynamic, they keep on changing. So we are influenced by a certain form of education that I can say is not completely, uh, I mean, it's not entirely local, but it's also, um, but it's global in nature, right? So we have got various institutions which are invested in education in Africa. And for me, uh, I do think, for example, talking about the way education is funded in, in, in higher institutions of learning, such as the universities in Africa, they are not um, completely independent in terms of how they design their curriculum in terms of the kind of human resource in, 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 in terms of the, the, the number of lecturers. So a lot of these factors are many times 
um, influenced by, for example, are many times influenced by, for example, um, global institutions such as the IMF, which in the 80s came up with the structural adjustment programs. And as a consequence of the SAPs, the education in, um, in Africa has been underdeveloped. And I think this encourages a sense of brain drain, though people are already speaking of brain gain back to Africa, because of these um, shrunk, shrunk opportunities for people to work in high institutions, it is quite appealing for people from the global south to move within the circuits of higher institutions in the, in the global north, in the west, right? I think I benefited from PhD in Germany. I was able to understand the intricacies of how education works in the west. And for me, I think we are not completely free to talk about our education as long as we are still um, many times, not all African nations, but many African nations being funded by um, development partners, the so-called development partners. But of course, we know that they have certain um, vested interest in all this kind of development. And again, talking about innovation, a lot of innovations from Africa, I can say, gather dust in um, repositories based in Africa. Because There's this tendency to view perhaps not the standard, right? So having this kind of elite um, publication journals and databases based in, in the West and the kind of resources that are limited to Africans to conduct research, both socially and in terms of natural sciences, to, to access this severely limits the kind of um, a globalized African um, innovation, right? Because all these work together to kind of marginalize the African researcher who is never the who is most of most of the times would not be an expert in the West, as opposed to the ease, financial ease of researchers based in the West to conduct innovative um, research in, in Africa, right? Yeah. Am I on time? Do I still have some few minutes left? Thank you, Oduo. I think I, I will go back to Dr. Roland, because your answer, I believe, will also help him to build up to his questions now, because, you know, he's a, 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 a specialized also in history of education. And I would like to know from him how colonization still interferes nowadays with the way African learns about the history and therefore the contribution to the world, what kind of interference he, he, he still sees. And the second question, as we are talking about innovation, and we know that innovation, it's also benefiting quite a lot naturally from the educational system. How fast does he see, at least in his experience in Cameroon and South Africa and so on, the African educational system moving towards supporting innovations, things, for instance, related to artificial intelligence, robotic, robotics within the African system. And what are the main constraints that he, he, he sees there? The reasons why perhaps the education system around the continent has not adopted uh, yet uh, these directions. Dr. Roland, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Could you? Need to... yes, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you, Pedro. Um, the first question I would link up with Oduo's, those answers, uh, but I want to focus on um, the question is how colonization still interferes in the way Africans learn about their history. 
Um, one of the things which I must mention here is the until the development of African historiography, most of the history about Africa was written by, by Europeans. And that's why we are talking about the new African historiography after 1950. So we still have a lot of that kind of history in Africa, which gives the impression that the Europeans came to, to, to deal away with evil, to kill evil practices, to, to give a, a paint a picture of Africa as an uncivilized uh, continent. Uh, meanwhile, uh, as an uncivilized continent, which was, which was rescued by European missionaries and European colonization. So we still have a lot of this in our schools. Uh, um, the and local history itself is the way is I mentioned the the nature of the historical writings that we still deal with. The second one has to do with the 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 the, the fundings. Um, even if even though Africans have independence, there is this neo colonial uh, um, umbrella that is still very much present in the African educational system through different funders. Um, projects, you may want to initiate a project which can transform the learning of history or which can investigate, rewrite the, the history of Africa. And you have funders determining how you write that history. Odo was talking about journals abroad. It's difficult sometimes to see, for instance, the problems that people like Czech and Tadjok went through to, to be able to, uh, to present a thesis on the origin of African civilization. So you have those kind of challenges. So fund, they say he who pays the piper determines the tune. So we have funders for our governments who determine textbook writing. And in fact, in South Africa, you, 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 you will have a lot of these textbooks written by uh, former colon, col, uh, 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 companies which had which, which which were part of the exploitation of the regime, and so some of the topics that you may want to bring into the learning of history in the country will not easily sail through the textbooks. And when you get to a place, a, a a chapter which wants to present clearly the African experience in history, that chapter is either not even mentioned or treated in a as if you just go there in five of terms and then they don't teach the act colonization still interferes with the way we learn our history in terms of uh, the old knowledge not having been swept away completely and in terms of the new difficulties blocking the new knowledge the real african knowledge from uh, entering into the curriculum uh, i always insist that uh, topics like the empires of Western Sudan should be taught. Empire of Ghana, for instance, which was prevailed, which was uh, 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 which presented a glorious, uh, 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 a glorious uh, space or page in the history of Africa at a time when the Europeans were also in difficulty. So, the, giving the impression that the time that the Europeans came to Africa. Um, uh, 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 they came to civilize, they came to improve, they came to, yes, they may have come to improve, but not to civilize, because civilizations had existed in this country, in this continent for a very long time. But when you go into uh, spaces where history is taught, curriculum, where curricula, where history, this kind of history, you find very few of those uh, 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 topics when it comes to the development, when it comes to the teaching of African history. So these are some of the ways that um, colonization continues to, to affect uh, the teaching of history and African contributions to the world. So we, 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 we may not even find spaces for us to, to, to publish, for instance, the research that we have undertaken. Um, I wrote my PhD thesis on the decolonial reading of the 
of British education in the south of Cameroon and each time a publisher, especially within the British domain, it, they, 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 they don't want to see that kind of writing. How else do you want the students to see an alternative reading of the history of Africa, if not the modernist perspective? So these are some of the challenges. Uh, and it makes it difficult for the Africans to contribute uh, the real picture in the historical development of the world. I attended a conference where somebody was presenting a global history curriculum uh, and did not mention uh, anything which was uh, what the name for Africa. Uh, the only thing I found there was that he was talking about people should learn about HIV in Mombasa. And I was, I was not happy in that conference. I said, you can't do that. We have uh, uh, the historical moments that we are proud of. Why would you want to teach a child that uh, the, 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 the clock uh, or a watch was made in Europe, and then when you come to Africa, you want to teach, uh, teach the students that it is HIV that they should learn about in Mombasa? It, is not, it, it was not pleasing at all in that conference, and we had a very rough time with those guys. These are some of the things. Now I go to the second question. I'm sorry, I see the moderator Ichi. How fast do you see the African educational system moving towards supporting innovations, for instance, related to AR and VR and robotics? Um, it, I, when we look at the state of the situation, you know, those of us who are like technocrats, we, we can only present the situation but the politicians are those who, who give the money for these things to happen. We can say that you have young men who, uh, but then the wheel is in terms of how fast, uh, I am a little bit pessimistic there within, with the kind of environment and the political leaders that we have. But if we have uh, political leaders who have the will to implement an Afrocentric uh, uh, initiative in the school systems, it is possible to integrate most of these things because you have African engin uh, engineers, Afri you have Africans working in all these fields, and it's possible for Africans to, to contribute to the development of the world if our own political leaders are ready to do it. Sometimes I'll say the money is not there, uh, but I think the money is there. It is just uh, uh, put into the wrong, the, the, the wrong pockets or diverted to some other uh, places. But so it's a matter of will. If the will is there tomorrow, then I'll tell you that in two days time, we'll be able to implement this because the knowledge is there, the competencies are there, but now it is the level of implementation that uh, warrants attention. Uh, I want to end there for now, and I'm hoping that we may come back to this discussion before the end of the of the uh, panel. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roland. Uh, given the time and given the nice questions we are receiving uh, over YouTube uh, that are being selected here, I will focus only on one question for Dr. Uh, Vimbai and for Dr. Oduo, so that we can finish something around, I would say, 5.35 Berlin time. Uh, and then we give the floor to the questions we are getting and also the opportunity for you to exchange among yourselves. Is, is that okay, Dr. Vimbai? So I, I, I think, uh, Dr. Vimbai, you, you have spoke already before about the third questions, a, a third question I wanted to ask uh, that is regarding oh. the transference from the oral traditions to the written literature and how this has been present, uh, not only in literature, but also in music, in the cinema. So I will jump uh, to the fourth, fourth question, that it's about, for instance, the production of books 
uh, by Afrofuturist authors, by books which combine avant-garde science fiction, cutting edge technology, black comics, and how these books can interfere in the African education system, because we know that certain books and certain uh, 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 publications, for instance, publications by Dr. Odur, who is here with us, are being used and implemented. So how do you see that? Can you, can you hear me? The, the floor oh, is Oh, thank you yours. for that. Yes, I am hearing you. Are you getting me? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will answer that question in general because I haven't read uh, Odo and Tasha's text, but I will focus on uh, the, 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 the general question, the question in general, not particularly referring to their text. So the question uh, wants to know, how do you think that uh, the cultural and creative products and services such as those books can interfere with African education? In my thinking, I think um, the cultural and creative products um, and Dr. Vimbai, sorry to interrupt you again, but your connection, it's not working very well. In this text, uh, uh, for example, we will we'll not enter to the teaching of African education. You look at, uh, hello, are you getting Pedro? No. Hello, Pedro? Not really, not really. I will, what I will, what I will do, uh, I, I, I will go for Dr. Zoduo question because you were interrupting the medium of, of, of what you are saying. So maybe I will give you a few minutes to check if the, the connection gets better over there. And then I get back to you for you to finish, okay? If, it, that, if that's okay, okay but I, I, will go, I will back to the final part of your question. Okay, I was suggesting that my, my name. Perhaps if I you turn off the video, I don't know, maybe if you turn off the video. What is it? Should I turn off the video? Perhaps that could be better. Try, try again oh, now. Okay, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Could, uh, yeah, now you, you can continue. Let's see if without the okay. video, it's okay. Okay. I was saying I'll answer this question in general, not necessarily referring to the text that I, I, I hear. So I was saying uh, the cultural and creative products uh, mentioned here would not interfere with African educational system. In my view, they will aid to the teaching. Why? Because I think this cultural culture in its form is not static. So any work of art uh, should respond to the time in which it is produced. So creative writings, the avant-garde, the science fiction, the cutting edge technology, black comics, will actually help in the understanding of the trend in the development of literature in Africa rather than interference. So I think um, besides looking at this text, they will aid to the understanding of the trend in the development of literature in Africa. I think brief I can say that uh, on that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vimbai. Really appreciate that. I'm sorry for the connection issue, okay? But uh, we could hear you clear, very clear now. I uh, will move to my, my, my last question before uh, asking, transferring actually the questions that are being sent uh, over YouTube and on the chat as well, the internal chat. Uh, before reach to this point, I would mm -hmm. like to know from you, Dr. Odua, uh, you have also, in addition to writing about fiction and so on, 
Uh, you have also written about the presence of African artifacts currently here in the Western world. So I would like to know what do you think about the presence of these, these uh, African artifacts and which benefits do you think the restitutions of these artifacts could bring to African communities, to local communities? And if you have perhaps concrete examples to demonstrate how this transference, if the, there, there is an example of that, uh, benefited this local community around Africa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, um, Pedro, for, for that interesting um, question. Sorry, Odo, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I think now Dr. Vimbai, if she could turn her video on, would be good because we are all showing up on YouTube, okay? So that we can see your face. Sorry, Odo, please continue. It's okay, no problem. Um, I, I, I was saying that it's quite an interesting question to, to think about the presences of these artifacts and human remains in Western metropolises like Berlin, um, uh, in Belgium, Brussels, and in New York, in London, uh, and, and all of these major cities. I think what we need to appreciate more is the nature of reflection of museums as spaces, right? So, so then one would ask, what, what are we reflecting when, about when we visit some of these museums? For me, visiting, looking, watching, and hearing about these human remains, for example, in Berlin's island of museums was quite, um, I mean, it was an emotional experience for me in the sense that a lot of closures have not been done just by virtue of some of these human remains still located in museums in the West, still located in research institutions um, across Germany, across France, and some of them actually even in private um, domestic collections, people own some of these artifacts in very, very familial and individual spaces. What is not always told, the other side of the story, I think which many visitors do not get to access, is the kind of violence that accompanied the looting of these artifacts from Benin, from Congo, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, all of these African countries. So to acknowledge that violence, would involve taking back these artifacts back to their sources of origins, right? So I think this is very, very important in so far as um, bringing closures to these, to these societies that were affected. Some of the kings who were murdered and their skulls, you know, taken to Germany and all these. So I think they need to be repatriated and restitution in my view needs to even offer financial compensation for some of these atrocities that were visited in the process of acquiring the so-called collections in western museums and um, I think museums as formal spaces in a way um, decouple these remains and these artifacts from their ritual environments in which quite often they were used. Art in Africa was not just, or is not just art for art's sake, but many times these artifacts were accompaniments, costumes in places of worship, in in places of governance, you know, in political spaces. So their symbolic values in their being taken to the West 
implies the long overdue, but which we need to get to end as soon as possible, the legacies of colonialism. So taking back these artifacts to Africa is a way of Africans, is one more way in which Africans inscribe their own agency. So I think this is one of the key things, one of the key effects of the transference of these artifacts and restitution of the human remains would do to, to African societies. And of course, a lot of colonial cultures, uh, um, colonialist cultures interfered with certain traditions, you know, valorizing the Western modernity and, and dehumanizing the West, the African ways of life. So in a way, these, um, restitutions and repatriations gives back uh, uh, gives back the, to Africans a chance to write their own histories that um, Dr. Andil was already talking about how to write our own histories. We want to see, you know, some of the mummies in South Sudan. Sorry, in Sudan, we want to see them there. We don't have to go to Europe to visit all of them. Right, so I think this is a key conversation that needs to be amplified across many um, platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oduo. I really uh, understand what you say because I personally have a Yoruba background in Brazil due to the Afro diaspora. And whenever I go to museums here around Europe, I feel, I usually say, energetically drained because I see loads of artifacts there that belong to our religious practices being exposed in a way that it's not where it should be. So I, I, I completely understand what you have said. And I would like to ask our panelists if they have questions among themselves or a quick comment that they would like to do because then we would use these last 20 minutes to go uh, in the direction of the public questions that are the, 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 action, the, the questions by the public that are being sent. Uh, thank you. Can I just jump in right there? Yes, please go on. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a quick one to Dr. Andile about traditions and and economic developments and you know yeah so I was just wondering because he mentioned some of these negative practices you know about um, women not being empowered through systems of schooling and I'm just wondering. Can, it, can we also think about traditions as also um, owning some productive force in the sense of, for, for, for example, talking about Ubuntu as we develop ourselves commercially, you know, trying to have dealings that have a human face with them, as opposed to this kind of rugged capitalism that the world finds itself at the moment. So can we draw from certain aspects of our traditions to advance our own um, our development and agenda as a people? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Oduo, I was trying to answer that question by typing the response that um, one of our uh, followers has one of the attendants, sorry, uh, asked by the side. Um, in this sense, the question was posed directly about negative tradition. And that is why I dwelled on negative traditions. But I also mentioned here that African traditions are, or tradition in general and culture is, is, is not only negative, we have used tradition productively in many sense. 
uh, there is an article that I wrote on healing our spirituality, uh, which is online. Um, uh, Dr. Roland? Think of what do I hear? what you were talking about. Our stock scenarios work in my village. Uh, took us. Dr. Holland? Yes, Pedro. Sorry. To yes, I can get you. Could, could you just go back very quickly on what you have said? Yes. The last yes. 10 words what, from what you have said, let's say. Okay. I was saying that uh, there was, there's an article that I wrote um, on killing our spirituality. Before then, I said that traditions, uh, we have used traditions positively in Africa and in terms of identity, in terms of our own social regulation, our identity, our social regulation, our stability, our ethical concerns, and our governance, our entertainment, and the many other aspects have, have hinged so much on tradition. And our corporate being as people um, will also be based on, on, on tradition. Um, we can also use traditions like, I agree with Dr. Oduro, that uh, uh, the traditional practices like Ubuntu have helped the Africans a lot. Uh, it is not, it is, it's something that we have grown with and we have lived with. I feel comfortable uh, wherever I am in Africa, wherever I find an African. In fact, when I lived in Sweden, I did not have anybody in my town who came from my country. But the moment we identified ourselves as African, we clicked immediately as brothers and sisters from different parts of the continent. Um, uh, one aspect of the African uh, mindset, which would hardly be taken away. One of the things which we still have left with us is our culture. Our culture in terms of how we receive people, our culture in how we see the world, our culture in terms of the music we play, how we enjoy life and all that. It, we still have a lot of that in us and it is positive. Uh, the question I answered in my, the first set of questions was how negative tradition, how tradition can affect education and affect socioeconomic development um, uh, negatively. Uh, for instance, we, I was talking about things like uh, female genital mutilation. I was talking about uh, the, the, for some cultures which do not want women to go to school, uh, for some cultures which, which will say, no, that is how we have had it. Uh, you must do it this way. Uh, it, is not, it is not that it is not good to perform traditional rites, but sometimes some of these traditional rites uh, are performed at the detriment of survival, at the detriment of growth, at the detriment of progress, and that is where it becomes inhibitive. But when we look at it in terms of the other advantages, in terms of regu social regulation, in terms of governance, in terms of our ethical values and the stability of society, we will see that tradition will go positively. I just want to link up with uh, Oduro's, uh, uh, this is now I have answered my question. Um, I'm just linking up with the, the way uh, museums, uh, the Dr. Roland? I think you are off. I think he, 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 his internet connection, it's a bit unstable. So perhaps I will go uh, to the comments very quickly. We have, uh, we, are, we are having a great audience and I have seen some interactions here, both on YouTube and uh, on, on Zoom as well, from 
I'm not so sure if they, these are the real names, probably not in some cases, but from Prodigal African, Alessane BA, Fabian Sonestone, Flora Bank, Cindy Teno, Teneboa. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing names uh, wrongly, but the fact is that we are getting interesting comments and, and, and questions. Uh, for instance, Prodigal African has said, there is a vast difference between education and indoctrination. The West seeks to indoctrinate Africa so as to ultimately exploit Africa. Education leads to independence. I think it's a very accurate uh, statement. Uh, then there is one question which I will leave it open to be answered by Luena Ricardo, who is also one of the organizers of the Bayhoff uh, conference. Uh, and thank you, Mira, Rodrian, for, and all the, the, the team for having select, selected the questions. Uh, and her question, Luana's question is, do you consider that the conceptualization of development is damaged by your understanding of what means to be developed once what we consider to be developed mirror the West? So it's basically they create here the concept and we will always be running to catch the concept that they have created. So what could be your perspectives on, the, on that. I think, Koduo, you could perhaps take this one. Koduo? Can I just respond to that? Or? Yeah, yes, yes. We can hear you now. Um. I do not get you quite clearly. Would you please just go over that and I respond to it? Okay, uh, yes. I will repeat it. Do you consider that the conceptualization of development uh, is damaged by the understanding of what means to be developed once what we consider to be developed mirror the West? Um. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm just wondering because I think development would mean different things to different people, right? It could be about infrastructural, you know, technological advancements and all this. But I think for me, development is um, to have human dignity um, regardless of one's station in life, regardless of one's um, socioeconomic background, that ability to, to lead some sort of a decent life. So in my view, if we can have all of these um, applicable to, to, uh, to all of us in the global South, which is relatively um, financially or economically, considered to be um, not as rich as the West. So I think for me, the basis is to have human dignity for all Africans, wherever they are. And I think this comes from a lot of um, factors. You know, you're talking about the quality of life one is leading. You're talking about one's um, sense of self-actualization. Um, and all these so ability of someone to live just beyond you know the immediacy of today's needs and all of that so if we have this for me this is the, what i think consider um development if our education does not give people in the global south that sense of self-dignity does not affirm their humanity, then I would consider that kind of development 
not um, appropriate or some are insufficient, inadequate in a way. So, yeah, so I think this is, uh, for me, a kind of philosophy that can be replicated across other um, various, you know, um, aspects or dimensions of, of living. Thank you very much, Dr. Oduo. I think we have Dr. Vimbai and Dr. Holland back. So perhaps I will give the, 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 the floor to Dr. Roland to finish what he was answering before very quickly, before we move to the next question. And then I would like to hear Dr. Vimbai in the next question. But first of all, Dr. Roland, the floor is yours again. Can you hear us? Yeah, thank you, Pedro. I don't, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. I was just saying that there was also a, a form of a tacit exploitation of the people in order to get these um, artworks to Europe. It was not only about violence. Uh, I give an example of Mission 21. There is, uh, I've not been there, but there is a museum in Switzerland. I don't know where it is. Um, a mis Mission 21 museum, which is made up of only artifacts from my village. And um, they, must send those at, they must send those things back. In addition to uh, sharing the money that they have made from that museum uh, since they opened it, I think uh, like Oduo was saying, there is need for compensation uh, because this is a form of exploitation, cultural exploitation that we are talking about. There is need for those things to send. If they bring them back to, to Cameroon and to my village, we'll have a museum set up there where we will also generate income. Apart from not generate, generate income, it is a form of our cultural identity. And by relating to it, we are fine. We produce, we, the Africans didn't produce some of these things for, for business to sell them. It is just a form of our cultural identity and there is need for those things to have been brought back to Africa. Uh, thank you. And when they bring them back, they must pay reparations and they must, we must share the profits that those museums are making in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Holland. Um, now there is another question that perhaps I will direct to Dr. Vimbai uh, by Alessane B.A., one of our uh, questions uh, that were selected from YouTube. If there are some conditions that the Africans are taking to defend uh, some bases on their culture, so they do not disappear. So, because in her uh, perspective, she's seeing uh, all the world going on the Western direction. Uh, and I must agree with this uh, perspective that especially when it comes to pop and mainstream culture, the reference that we have are from the West, although it's important to also mention, I believe that there are loads of musical productions, film productions that are done by Afro descendants, by Africans that are also living in the Western world. Uh, but I would like to hear from you, Dr. Vimbai, if you know any examples you know, on, on the ground that communities are, uh, are developing to defend their heritage perhaps, or the expressions so that they keep it safely from cultural instinction. Thank you, Pedro, for the question. I pardon me for my network as this I have just gone so it's big now. I hope it won't interfere again. Okay, on that one, um, I think uh, when you look at uh, certain aspects of culture, we have what we call, we have core aspects that doesn't change. Even if we say culture is not static, there are some issues that 
can change about our cultures. But there are certain aspects of it that are core. For example, we talk of our language. Uh, you cannot change your language. Language is still there. When you live in Germany, you live in America, you live in Zimbabwe, you live in Nigeria, you can still be part of your cultural group through language. Uh, there are also things to do with um, the instruments, for example, in music, like the question is the music, musical uh, components. When you look at uh, the music that is produced by Africans, even uh, those in the diaspora, even the local ones, you look at their instruments that they use, they try to incorporate traditional instruments like um, CTC, even if they change in terms of probably they are um, improved, but the sound patterns and so forth, they are taken from the, our tradition. We also talk of the dressing. Dressing is another core part of our culture that, that cannot change. The form of dressing may change. People, people can now put on different clothes, but the idea of putting on something on their bodies uh, whilst they are performing, uh, probably to, to represent some other aspects, probably they want to, to showcase a traditional um, musical component that shows people having their traditions. They still have to go back to that one so that they can still communicate to the world on issues that they are singing about. So I think um, he, there is a way of protecting this heritage through music by way of using uh, different clothes, different, uh, um, what you call these, the, 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 the instruments that they use through language and so forth. That way heritage can also be uh, protected from extinction. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vimbai. Are you hearing me, Pet? Yes, yes, we could hear you clearly. Thank you. I just would like to ask if there is any other... Pedro, I'm through. Yes, yes. We could hear you perfectly. I just wanted to ask if the other panelists uh, would like to comment on these uh, last questions before we close. If you know about any initiative that it's been taken on the ground to protect cultural expressions, cultural heritage, so these expressions do not get extinct, perhaps. Yeah, I can I say something? I don't know if I am answering the right question, but I think uh, UNESCO has a lot of. Um, international laws on but Pedro, maybe you are in a better position to answer this, to tell us more about this. But there was a time I was teaching a course on heritage, on, um, heritage uh, legislation. And uh, we had a lot to do with uh, UNESCO uh, laws, recommendations and all that. But I think within our own countries, uh, the ministries of culture should be able to the ministries of culture have in Cameroon uh, um, uh, the import and even the laws that 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 enable um, um, artists to benefit from their cultural productions. Uh, this is a form of encouragement. Um, I. Then we also have organizations, non-governmental organizations that are working. But the key thing is that uh, the country should be able to have legislation uh, passed regarding the state of the artist, the, the export and, and import of uh, cultural artifacts. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Roland. Indeed, uh, Alessandra, there is a, a convention by UNESCO that it's uh, 
the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, in which offers a legal framework on an international level and uh, when the country becomes a signatory of this conference, all this legislation start to be considered as a national legislation as well that could be implemented. So if you type on Google UNESCO 2005 convention, you see that within these conventions, there are uh, a number of mechanisms uh, going this direction, the direction of protecting uh, heritage expressions, tangible and intangible heritage, so they do not get uh, extinct or overwhelmed or influenced considerably by Western mainstream culture and so on. Uh, I would like to start the closing remarks because we are reaching already the time. Uh, we had another participant, uh, Itasha Womack, who couldn't make, unfortunately, today. So our apologies uh, in her name and in our name as well. But I believe we could have a very interesting and productive conversation, remembering that today is the first day um, of the program of the Model Afghan Union by Hoyt Conference 2021. And the programs keep rolling till Sunday, uh, till the weekend. So we invite you all to register or to have a look at the schedule and follow act the activities that are going to take place. Today, there is after this uh, panel, also the cooking together section, I believe, which, which is still taking place. Please, if it's not uh, somebody from the organization, let me know. But uh, doors are open for us to keep talking and to keep discussing, to keep exchanging. Uh, I would like to, 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 to ask, you know, the, 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 the the, the, the panelists to say their final words and then I come back just to the final remarks. So Dr. Roland, we start with you and then we go to Dr. Vimbai and then Dr. Oduo and we close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro. I, it's an interesting discussion which cannot end here. I encourage our, our viewers to, uh, to consider it as a, a point of Uh, igniting a debate or a discussion Dr. in the conference. Dr. Roland, I want to learn. Dr. Roland, uh, we got lost a bit, so perhaps if you could turn off the, the, the video, meanwhile you are talking, we, could, we would be able to hear you better. Thank you. Oh. All right. Okay, I was saying that I am just grateful and that uh, I am hoping that it, the conference uh, will continue to be as, as enriching as this panel has been. Uh, I thank you, Pedro, for, and for Luena for giving us the opportunity, and I encourage the viewers to stay on. I would stay on to the other panels and listen and follow uh, till the end of the conference. Um, I thank my co-panelists, and uh, it's the beginning of a family, and I hope that we'll continue to collaborate and <laughs> after this by emails and by other contacts, we will be together. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro, and thank you, Luena, for having me on this panel. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much, Dr. Holland, as well. Uh, Dr. Vimbai, are you there with us? I'm not so sure if she's still connected. So I would uh, transfer the, 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 the opportunity to you, Odwo, to, to your closing remarks, please. Um, thank you very much for making me to be part of this great conversation. And I appreciate the contributions that I've learned from my colleagues. And I really look forward to 
engaging you, all of you individually, even after the end of this, um, this uh, panel discussion that we've had. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be peeping in to some of the panel discussions. Right now, I think I've got some other engagements that I need to go to. So I'll be there tomorrow and some of the panels are quite interesting and I'll, I'll join all of them. So thank you again for this great organization and for inviting me over to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Odua. Unfortunately, we lost Dr. Vimbai. I think everybody had today a uh, problem with internet connection, some, some, some bumps, but uh, we could get the sense, we could get the experience, we could get the skills and everything you offered us. So I believe this was a very enriching conversation which is gonna be available, which is already available on YouTube. So I would like to, to invite you to share this conversation because we built today a cornerstone. We had uh, panelists from Afro diaspora, from different regions in Africa, each of them bringing uh, very important perspectives. So I would like to thank want to thank once more uh, the organization for bringing us together and for giving us the opportunity to be together. It's not every day that we have these chances to be connecting across Africa and Afro diaspora. I usually take part in loads of conversations, events, and I believe the panelists as well. And they also know that these moments are still unfortunately very rare. However, as Dr. Holland said and Dr. Oduo uh, uh, also concluded, we are building a family, a community that needs to be strengthened. And uh, there is a, a, a good a role that we play already, but let's to be more connected, be more in touch with each other. In this way, we will be able to set our own conversations and standards. And congratulations once more to the Model African Union by Heart Conference 2021 for this great opportunity. See you in the next days. Have a good afternoon, everyone.